at the outset, I want to thank my dear friend uh, Serena and Madalena for inviting me for this uh, uh, important workshop. And uh, this workshop uh, has a great meaning to me as well as to all of you because this is uh, we are discussing the new technology which is very promising. And uh, as Wendy mentioned that uh, now you'll have to switch over for the two aspects, one from the medical science to the agriculture science. And then second is that not the research, but uh, something uh, I'll be discussing about the policies and uh, with relevant to the Asia Pacific region. Here you see that uh, I work for an organization which is called the Asia Pacific Association of Agriculture Research Institution, commonly known as the CAPARI. It is a very vibrant regional organization, the initiative of the FAO. And in that, a flagship program is of the Asia Pacific Consortium on Agriculture, Biotechnology, and Bioresources. I coordinate the activities in the region, Asia Pacific region, regarding the promotion of the biotechnology and the conservation and utilization of bioresources. Uh, just to give a few words about the organization to those who may not be knowing this organization because it is in Asia Pacific and the, I see the participants from the Europe and the Africa, but very less participants from Asia. So this is the, okay, I will take some there. This uh, APARI was established with the initiative of uh, FAO, Regional Office of Asia Pacific, located in Bangkok, Thailand, and it was established in 1990. Uh, the, the presence of uh, the members, uh, because it is the member-based organization, uh, you can see in this map that the presence is uh, in the Asia Pacific region, particularly this is the region where we work. But you see the presence here of the, because the several members are located in the uh, CG centers, particularly the US, Mexico, and Peru, and some in United Kingdom. So in the next slide, I'll be telling that uh, how we work and uh, we are the members of the Asia Pacific. The members are particularly the country members of uh, National Agriculture Research System international research organization, particularly the CG centers, higher education sector, and sub-regional bodies, association, foundation, and trust. All told, 83 members from the 33 country belongs. And we work on the funding of the donors, as well as we have some projects sponsored by FAO, WTO, and ACAR, and the COA is our the main donor to carry out the activities particularly in the biotechnology, COA is the uh, donor made donor. So if you have the look of, uh, closer look of this uh, area, you can have that the, we have the different categories of member and uh, uh, forget about the role of this member and why they are categorized and what is the criteria, but I will say that main the regular members, which are the 21 national agriculture research system and we work them and we work for them. Associate member mainly the CG center, some higher education center, agriculture universities, and the another some agriculture universities and some uh, national agriculture system of the different countries are also fall in the category of the affiliate member. The reciprocal member are the regional flora, fora or the uh, global fora like GFAR, and the SARC and the ASEAN, they are the member of this, and as mentioned, the total 83 members are there. This is the given the glimpse of the uh, different NAS uh, of the, and in fact, the, 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 the country governments are the member of APARI, but they have nominated the National Agricultural Research System, so we work the National Agricultural Research System of those uh, different governments. This gives the idea about the uh, associate member, particularly the CG center. All the CG centers uh, are the member of APARI and they are categorized with associate member. As I mentioned initially that the APCOAB, which is known as uh, Asia Pacific Consortium of Agriculture Biotechnology and Resource, Bioresources, this is one of the flagship program of the APARI uh, with the objectives mainly, the strategic area that we are working and they're setting the research priorities in the uh, region uh, by, uh, by inviting them to the expert consultation, workshops, etc. 
The important activity is the capacity building to carry out the activities and to promote the activities in biotechnology for application, its application, as well as the conservation and sustainable utilization of the bioresources in the region. And uh, the another area is the policies, uh, policy development or the policy advocacy, this uh, activity. And lastly, uh, equally important is the knowledge generation and the knowledge dissemination regarding the biotechnology and bioresources. So when we talk about the regulatory, then the people are the two ways that uh, one, they use, uh, they propagate that the traditional agriculture or organic agriculture is the solution for all the problem. But another, the scientific way is that we need the new technology, new innovations all the time. And why not? Because the science is there to serve the humanity and science is there to give the new technology. So why we need sometimes the new technology and start to switch over from the existing to the new technology because of certain compelling situation and certain compelling situation, the two important situation are the population pressure, particularly in the Asia Pacific region. Please uh, uh, note that I'll be talking in the uh, context of Asia Pacific region only. So with these slides, I want to just give an impression that nine out of top 20 countries, populated countries mentioned here, are falling in the region of the Asia, Asia region. And if you look at the Asia Pacific region, the oh, about total 60% population of the world is inhabiting in this region. And if you address any issue or the food security issue, particularly of the 60% population, I think you are going to achieve a great and as well as uh, at, at the, uh, related to the food security or nut nutritional security in this region. So starting from this, and we are going to reach this, the population is one of the pressure which always warrants to have the new technology to address the issues. Uh, these two slides I have included because they're the two sub-regions of the Asia Pacific region, one the SAR countries and analyze the ASEAN countries, which are most populated and you forget about this figure because many of you will not believe that this figure is true because the population increase in these countries are tremendous. But I want to draw your kind attention for the last column that what is the GDP per capita income in these country? For take it as low as 528 in Afghanistan. And of course in the SAR countries, if you look at the better situation in Maldives, but see the Maldives population, so the this, if the GDP is better in the Maldives, the population is very less. And India is one, 1.36 billion. I have not included China, which is again the 1.38 billion. But ASEAN countries and the Southeast Asian country particularly, there are the 10 countries and you can look, situation is little better than the SAR countries, but not as good as it should be. And the per capita GDP is still as low as the 1354 Myanmar and uh, Singapore is, of course, Singapore is falling in the geographically in ASEAN region, but it is as good as any developed country. So one of the pressure of the population and the second pressure, because all these countries in the Asia Pacific region, their GDP or their the economic growth or the agriculture growth, uh, economic growth depend upon the agriculture. And you know very well that agriculture is facing a lot of challenge in the wake of the climate changes, water shortages, salinity for the abiotic stresses, and the arable land is being restricted because of the urban developmental activities in the region. So you will have to grow more in the less area. And the new biotic stresses, disease, pests are another challenge. So how to address these challenge in the region that one of the solution, I'm not saying it is panacea, but the one of the solution is could be thought of the biotechnology and its application. So what are the biotechnology application, uh, particularly in the agriculture? This slide shows that how this tradition biotechnology has grown up up to the contemporary biotechnology. And if you see at the axis, this increasing complexity is showing and the rising cost. Both are important because rising cost or the affordability and increasing complexity of the technology, uses of those technology, it requires a lot of capacity development program. So 
in this few slides, I'll be uh, giving that uh, the FAO has mapped what is the level of the capacity in the region to have the application of biotechnology to address the issues in the agriculture particularly. So this slide I have included just to tell to this audience that I'll be using low tech, medium tech, and high tech uh, technology in my next uh, three, four slides, uh, which I try to define broadly that what is meaning the low tech and what is meaning medium tech and high tech. Uh, just these terms are not uh, the uh, my term, but uh, I have borrowed it from the FAO is using agriculture biotechnology these terms. So please keep in mind that why I'm using the low tech and medium tech and high tech, I mean these kind of technology in my presentation. Here I want to mention that the low tech doesn't mean that it has the less importance. At the same time, high tech doesn't mean it has the very high importance. Because it depends upon the region, it depends upon the countries. Sometimes low tech is most important to those countries in comparison to high tech or vice versa. So these uh, slides, uh, as I mentioned, are how to read these slides. This column talks about the application of agriculture biotechnology in these categories. This column reads about, and this horizontal column, the sector where the application is uh, of the biotechnology is there against this kind of categories of the use. So I will not go into this matrix. This, uh, this study was made by FAO, and recently FAO published the report. I have taken this uh, data from there. You just can see this very high use on this uh, crop and life sector, sector is very good, but forestry and fishery or aquaculture is very less. And if that sector is being used for the, having the application, that is very few country and few country like the Japan, Australia, India, and Korea. So most of these countries are in the low to medium use of this application. And try to find out the gaps of the what are the application of the biotechnology. One important is the uneven adoption of technology across the countries and across the sector. Because in the region, although the climate challenges, all the other conditions are same, other challenges are same. But the adoption is not in all the sectors, important sectors are uneven. And the partial adoption of potential low to medium tech biotechnology lack of adoption of medium and high level technology due to lack of extension and lack of collaboration of the partnership issues and technology in that way. Similarly to application, to have the uh, maximum application that the another factor is the, what is the level of the capacity status in for using the biotechnology. The pattern of the slide is the same, the sectors and the use. Again, I want to draw your attention that these are the countries where the very high use of the, this technology capacity is available. Whereas in other countries, the, the capacity is very at very low. And these are certain major gaps which have been identified that why the capacity in this region or in this particular country to use of the biotechnology is very low. Another important is that area is the enabling policies, what we are talking in this uh, coming uh, this session. That Enabling policies are very important. Uh, sometimes when I was the research, bench researcher, I used not to give the much importance to the policies. Maybe uh, with you, this uh, uh, situation is there. But uh, for last uh, about 10 years, I have been the policy development or development, not in the active research. Now I realize the importance of the enabling policy uh, is so important, it is equally important to doing any research. Without the policy, enabling policy, your research cannot be applied. What we are facing uh, nowadays, and we are discussing how to use this important technology and how to regulate this technology. So the situation is not uh, uh, the same almost because the regulation for the very high use of technology is uh, not uh, very good. So APARI, apart from this survey, APARI also organized, uh, keep on organizing the survey, and uh, in 2018, we organized a uh, regional expert consultation on agriculture biotechnology to know that what is the status, what is the requirement of the, this, uh, these countries. So 
uh, I am uh, skipping the other thing, the research and technology. But what I want to draw your attention that high-tech agribiotechnology, which includes the gene and gene genome sequencing, if you remember my first slides. So in each region, they have realized that gene editing is one of the priority that the, the requirement of this uh, uh, region. Uh, I think my, my friend uh, Dr. Tanu has mentioned about this, how this uh, gene editing is not the uh, is the plant bedding. So this slide also included. Just I want to mention it is this not not different from the conventional bedding. Why it is not different conventional bedding? In these slides you can see the evolution of the plant bedding, and here it is the difference is only for the positive difference. This, uh, this highest precision, at which can be done more easily in less time, you can have the object, uh, sorry, product through this uh, gene editing technology. So the question uh, are there that how this gene editing technology particularly identified the issues in agriculture, not in other sector, that what are the biosafety and risk assessment, what are the important issues are there? You see that most of the ongoing uh, debate around the regulation of gene editing product where the no uh, novel RNA or protein is there vis-a-vis -vis the GMO is transgenic. Because when we talk about the gene editing, they immediately draw the attention or the comparison to the GMOs. How to do a risk assessment for gene editing products? Is the existing risk assessment framework necessary for safety assessment of gene editing products? Can genetic detection Techniques be employed to differentiate between gene identity product and similar product obtained by conventional bidding? And if so, the unknown undisclosed modification which does not involve the incorporation of foreign sequences, does not it affect or the, that uh, compared with the conventional bidding or random mutagenesis or the natural mutagenesis? These are the issues that then we talk the regulation that we'll have to discuss, we'll have to keep in mind developing the regulation and then how to enforce the regulation for the gene editing product in the agriculture. When the detection of genomic change is not possible, the small nucleotide replacement is not its equivalent to the mutagenesis or the natural mutation. The enforcement of any regulation will be very difficult in most gene editing product unless this, uh, it is a foreign DNA originating from a sexually incompatible organism and only those products such as SGN3 with foreign DNA where detection is possible. So if this unforeseeable situation and we want to apply this uh, regulation again, then my, my opinion that it will have a major dent on the public trust, scientific innovation, and also the fairness of the regulatory authority, which is not to be regulated. This requires the regulation and we are talking about the, it should be regulated. This slide I have uh, including from ISA, the BBNA is there, their organization is doing very well compiling the data. Just I want to say that many countries are growing the GMOs and this area is increasing every year. So the question is, are GMO harmful? If the 20, 30 years consumption of GM crops, having more than 3000 trials, having more than many trials for the health and all that and found no harmful, then why the lot of few and cry about GMO? I have the fear that the gene editing should not, see, uh, should not face the same fate like GMO has. So this slide again, this I have used the infographics from the ISA that how much biotech has been com uh, contributing for for achieving the sustainable development goal, which have been mentioned by the, which have been targeted by the United Nations in 2015. I'll not go into the, because this is beyond my scope of my uh, discussion, but just to give you an exa example, that almost all uh, sustainable develop goal, development goals are being touched or contributed by these biotech crops. So if they are, they are doing that, what we want to achieve, then why a lot of you and cry? because the two powerful bodies in the world, one is the USDA and one is EU. You know every, uh, very well what is their situation. So my question is, why GM editing crops or animals are not regulated in US and why in U EU? It's a million dollar question. I, I have no authority to question the, 
this regulatory authority, but as a scientist, I can, I can apply my mind to raise this question why it is so. Now, the current regulation in this uh, 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 Asia-Pacific region, I have tried to put, sorry, the situation here. I'll not touch upon this region. Only thing, this, this is the region where we are working and I want to put it the here. You may see that this is jumbled and uh, it's, uh, it's not very clear uh, geographically wise. I could have put one slide and said that one uh, in this country, this is the situation, this is the situation. I deliberately put it because the gene editing is seen as one of the promising technology and all these countries except Japan and Australia who have already placed, had the place of the policy, but all other countries are very actively considering and debating uh, to develop the policies in the, uh, for the regulation policies for the gene editing product. I, I have no intention to review what is the gene editing products are available, but just want to show in the region that, uh, again, I had taken this uh, information from FAO, a uh, lot, lot of information is available, but I want to say all these countries are using the CRISPR-Cas9 and which crops are the main crops, wheat and rice, for the different purposes to achieve the products. But the challenge is regulation, and regulation challenge with the regulation commercialization, communication, Bibiana was just talking, uh, it's very important. Uh, and Bibiana, thank you for giving the magic formula I have circulated in my group, they are appreciating a lot that and the capacity building, which I had already talked about. Now, there's one, uh, I have used this Albert Einstein widely credited by saying that definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. <laughs> so it's, I'm not saying this, uh, the great man he has mentioned, I have used it that why harmonization of regulatory process is not necessary. So harmonization of regulatory process because particularly in the Asia Pacific region where the countries are poor and the smallholder farmers are to be the beneficiary of this technology, the, it's a win-win situation. It's a win-win situation for the government and regulators. I mentioned the here for the uh, time I'm seeing that it is, I'm taking the time a little more. So I will uh, avoid the discussion, detailed discussion, but any of the aspect I am ready to uh, answer you. For the developers and the public, for the public and consumers. All the three stakeholders are having the win-win situation if the regulatory harmonization is there, though it is very difficult. It is an arduous task because not science is involved, it is politics is involved, and the country's politics, sovereignty, there are several, uh, several issues are involved in that. So recently in India with the CRISET, we have this regional expert consultation of gene editing and its regulation inviting all the Asia Pacific countries and about 125 participants were there, and the purpose was to review what is the status of the regulatory uh, process in uh, regulatory in this um, region. And back-to-back, uh, -back, there was an international hands-on training on genome editing technology was also uh, organized, having the 11 country participated, including the Africa and Asia Pacific region. So the, I will have the, when they was do only two minutes I will take, they are the key re draft recommendations came out from the expert consultation on gene editing in Asia Pacific region, which I'll take a minute to read it about very slowly so that you can understand the gravity of the requirement of the technology and the gravity of the requirement of the regulation process in this region. The, some governments have already taken the position that genome edited plants should be subject only to those same regulation as their conventionally bred counterparts. The regulatory oversight should be based on final product rather than the process involved. Therefore, it was recommended that consistency can be achieved by not regulating products of gene editing when it does not contain a novel combination of genetic material. Final product contains genetic material from sexually compatible species or any from the mutagenesis involved. The example was given the Australia and Japan, which they are following the regulation in this uh, spread. The second is uh, science-based predictable regulation with clear timelines, because the regulation process is sometimes very 
unending time is there. We have seen witness in the GMOs, case of GMO, should be there. Third is important, the harmonization approach of within the Asia-Pacific region is important for collaboration research, capacity development, and regulation, what I have already talked about. The fourth one is that the significant efforts are from all stakeholders to improve and prioritize communication and information exchange about genome editing, particularly focusing on how it is an extension of convention breeding and the focus program on communicating science-based information in easy to understand language should be initiated academics, industry expert, so that we will not face the situation what we have faced in the GMOs. And fifth is the innovative institutional arrangement of network collaboration are required and uh, we are very actively discussing with the different countries, heads, that how we can have the collaboration in a, at a regional level. And last one is that the partnership was important for the public, uh, public partnership and public-private partnership. So regional organization like ours, APARI, was given the responsibility to develop the network projects involving national partners in the interest of the smallholder farmers. And I hear uh, always uh, I'll keep on looking for the donors and the partners to develop the network project, particularly for capacity development and for the regulatory process developments. Uh, this is my last but one slide that to thanks our partners. We are working with the different partners and we are working for those partners. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you.